Our second speaker is Barbara Lamprecht. She is a architectural historian um, specializing in modern architecture. Her work ranges from technical evaluations of buildings and national register listings to project supervision of rehabilitation projects. As many of you know, she is the author of Richard Neutra, Complete Works, and Neutra, Selected Projects, both by Tashin Publications. Thank you, Getty Conservation Institute, Kyle and Susan, for inviting me to participate. Nice to see you all. At the end of Dione Neutra's oral biography, her interviewer asks, well, since Richard Neutra is so modern, why doesn't he like modern music? Mrs. Neutra replies, well, that music represents the disharmony in the world all around us. And I think Mr. Neutra was a harmonizer. So this lecture asks, how Neutra achieved harmony in a little speck house and in a big church, and how do we make decisions about conserving that combination of hubris, great design, and humility, readily available, inexpensive post-war materials? In a way, everyday modernism, that phrase, is redundant. Part of its mission was liberated living, licht and luft, light and fresh air, an abundant graciousness for every man, whether that is the, the, the European prole or the American suburbanite with our now mythologized and idealized post-war mid-century style we idolize for its optimism and authenticity. But Neutra's houses, commis houses were commissioned by those in middle-class, middle-of-the-road professions, and they're now primarily a high-status collectible. So what governs what gets restored when the tax credits and monument status is not driving the rehabilitation and where funds can do almost anything that we want? That's even harder in a way, all carrot, no stick. I'm gonna speak on just one, two works by Richard Neutra, although given Anthony's wonderful lecture, I wish I would have spoken also about the Strathmore Apartments by Neutra and maybe a bit of Bebeval in Germany, but maybe we can pick that up later. Um, in which I'm involved as a uh, consultant or project manager. The first was one of Neutra's few spec houses in which the developer Jacques Villard and the young builder Paul Smith approached Neutra. The house stands right at the intersection of hubris and humility, embodies that tension. It delivers superb architecture using standard materials in a very interesting way. Everyone involved with the project was determined to make it marketable and sellable. It was sold for about 26,000 and it was built for about 21,000. I'd like to also mention that I'd like to dedicate this talk tonight to John Blanton, uh, one of Neutra's chief project architects. So this is the Haley House. It was completed in 1959. Uh, you can see the orthodox Neutra colors, um, especially on the masonite. We have a nice Neutra brown. Um, quite a bit of deterioration. The beam ends were cracked, especially on the southern exposure. Um, concrete, um, interior woodwork, uh, roof had to be replaced, a lot of stuff, drainage. And this is another orthodox um, uh, rep um, representation of the east primary facade of garden, what was the formerly the Garden Grove Community Church, now known as the Arboretum, owned by the Roman Catholic Diocese of Orange. And as you can see, we have lots of nice neutrals, right? No color on that facade. This is the one of the original or very early photographs of the the facade of the, the Haley House, which is um, off Lake Hollywood Drive in the Hollywood Hills. Um, it's in that older portion of the Hollywood Hills, uh, not, not the grandiose portion on, on the other side. But you can see that um, the plantings, you can see lots of boulders. Um, the plantings are primarily um, Fatsia, um, Aurelia, and then Yucca filamentosa. And what was interesting about um, the plantings in this Julius Schulman photograph was that um, what was then uh, readily available, these two plants were very popular mid-century plants. 
Um, the, the yucca is now very, the yucca filamentosa, the unhybrided version, is very, is not so hard to find. I mean, it's not so easy to find. Um, our horticulturalist, Frank Burkhardt, had to look, um, I think, for 10 growers before he found a plant um, that, would, that could do the job and be a good, hardy specimen. Um, this, so this wonderful combination of the humility of that, that old mid-century paradigm and its relative um, difficulty in obtaining it now, making it rare, that combination of preciousness and humility uh, made it today much more appealing. So we tried to reinstate that. And there's, there's some of those plantings being reinstated. Um, I just wanted to show you that the site plan, uh, the carport is at the north, um, and this is a, a box, right? This is a box, but it's a beautifully organized box. The, the deck um, overlooks this very sharp 35 degree slope, and so you can see from the side uh, how, how incredibly steep that slope is. And when we had to replace the concrete, um, I tried to have the architecture itself inform whatever datum lines. I, I kind of drew the drew from the architecture to define datum lines. So even even at the ground plane, that every every aspect of the design could resonate in concert with one another. You'll note too that Neutra the the. The distance from the front of the house to the street is very, very compressed. It's a very, very tight. It was a throw. It's a very tight lot. It's a, it's a throwaway lot. Nobody wanted to build there. But this brings us to a, a really important aspect of Neutra's thinking, and that is um, the views to the horizon. And um, earlier, uh, Donlin and I were taking a stroll out on the Getty, and I realized that, you know, all around this wonderful site you have access to the horizon line at all times. And Neutra believed fervently in access to nature, um, nature near, nature mid, and nature far, that you needed all those three components or at least elements of, of elements that replicated some of those natural components um, in any environment. So the setting, the setting is always extended out beyond the parameters of the house. So here on the, on the right, you see um, an aerial of the Haley, and it's essentially hemmed in by those overgrown silk revelias and the bamboo flanking east and west. And so it's, it's completely compromising that requisite access to nature, because for Neutra, uh, nature may or may not be romantic, et cetera, pastoral, you know, picturesque or sublime, but in any case, it was requisite. And on the right, um, on the left rather, you see um, the kind of restored access to the horizon line with a more diaphanous, um, somewhat more sensitive pruning of the silk revelias. You also see the continuity of the, the datum line running, in, running from the, the windows, the casement window, and fixed on windows on the left, and then running out into the landscape outside um, in that 30-inch uh, handrail there, which I'll talk a lot more about very soon. Thinking I could avail myself of the California State Historical Building Code, um, I, in, because I wanted to maintain or think about ways to maintain that 30-inch guardrail height that, that, was, that was so um, indicative of Neutra's Neutra's thinking, um, I checked with Survey LA to find out whether the house was listed on any inventory, as well as Shippo up north. And um, I learned to my surprise that the Haley House had not been included in any inventory. And I thought, and I said, well, why not? Um, and it was because the permit was not signed by Richard Neutra. It was signed by John Blanton. And as soon as I saw John's familiar handwriting, I thought, oh, we're home, because I knew exactly what had happened. Like many an architect and many an office, the principal doesn't often go to the building department to sign the permit. Um, somebody else does. 
Uh, you can see on the top, this is uh, Jason Haley's. Uh, Jason Haley was the, the client that bought the spec house from Villard and Paul Smith. And you can see that, that wood railing, and the, it, it is wood. It was kind of intended in part to be, to be metal, but the spec builders couldn't afford it. That was quickly valued, engineered out of the formula. And in contrast, you see a very similar setting. This is the Kilberry House, 1956, in Rancho Palos Verdes. And you can see that same, that same datum line of, of long, lean, horizontal lines, but absolutely nothing protecting you. But in contrast to the Haley House, where there's a good old fall, um, at least you're only falling one story <laughs> at the Kilberry House. None of the children ever got hurt, Mrs. Kilberry told me. So you can see the original building permit with John Blanton's signature there. And then um, my thanks to Taylor Loudon. Uh, Taylor rounded up original building permits um, from 1959. This happens to be the 1959 edition where, um, not surprisingly, um, the guardrail height is, is 30 inches. And there's just a, a reminder of that 30 inch height and then 21 inches below that per code is a secondary horizontal rail. And then these are some of the sketches that Taylor developed based on an idea um, that the um, John of Glendale Glass helped me um, formulate because I did not want to have cables. I did not want to have that kind of um, 80s to me, kind of 90s idea of structure um, involved with this. Um, in part because Neutra loathed telephone wires and telephone poles. And um, anything that was visually agitating or obtrusive, um, he regarded as um, a cognitive indig indignation. And I, I didn't want to deal with Neutra waking me up at night. <laughs> so thank you, Taylor, for helping helping greatly refine that, that idea. Um, and here you see John and Taylor, um, we're all talking about what we're gonna do with this. And there's an example of a close up of the Kilberry railing that initially I wanted to replicate. But then I started to think, you know, there's something, there's something wonderful about a, a two by four wood railing that still, um, expresses Neutra's intentions about the datum line. So why don't we kind of let that live and let that have a function um, that's actually beyond aesthetics and give a place, for example, for your hand to rest or something like that and be the first line of defense. So I just wanted to articulate very, very briefly a couple of um, Neutra tenants. Um, you know, as you probably know well, born in Vienna, um, apprenticed more or less with Adolf Loos, and uh, admired the works of um, Otto Wagner, taught at the Bauhaus in the winter of 1930, where he was exposed to Gestalt aesthetics um, while hanging out with Paul Klee and Lionel Feininger. Um, he was a canonical modernist in many ways, um, in that uh, there's, there's your Befridus Vonen, right? Liberated living, um, and there is that languid woman in the chair and someone leaning out over, looks a bit higher than 30 inches, wouldn't you say? Um, and then um, heliotherapy, sun therapy in, in a clinic, in a sanatorium. Um, which were always in kind of incredibly idyllic natural settings, high in the Alps. They were also tremendously popular watering holes for lots of the architects. Um, great places to bring your mistresses and apart from getting heliotherapy. Um, but many modern architects um, took a lot of ideas on hygiene, light, cleanliness, white walls from, from these sanatoria. Uh, Neutra took it several steps farther, though, and apart from canonical modernism. 
Um, he was self-trained in evolutionary biology, um, experimental psychology, physiological psychology, through people like Theodor Fechner and Wilhelm Wundt, uh, German scientists in the 19th century, um, Gestalt aesthetics, as I mentioned before, um, all in the game of um, how many feet, how many square feet does it take to lead the good life? How many square feet do you, do you need to, where I can play some visual games with you? So evolutionary biology um, taught him that we, we emerged and um, where our brains evolved on the savannas of East Africa and where trees and access to nature and copses, copses of trees were part of who we are as fun fundamentally as human beings. And we have to reinstate that kind of condition in order to thrive and feel kinetically engaged with the environment. And as you can see, um, just in a way, as, as, as Anthony was talking about Ains dwellings, um, in these three drawings, these renderings by, by Neutra, which he would do at like five o'clock in the morning in his pajamas in bed on cardboard. In fact, you can see some of the vertical striations in the cardboard in this rendering of Garden Grove on the right. Um, but nature has completely taken over, right? You have this writhing, sky and and these natural forms and the the house even though it's his design is quite interchangeable he wrote several books and one of them is a, a, a very poetical gentle little book called mystery and realities of the sight which is a wonderful um expression of his his take on genius lo loci I also wanted to talk a little bit about boulders. I realize I've got, I've got seven minutes left, I think. Um, the role of boulders. And we all know boulders through maybe Japanese vernacular architectural tra traditions and Japanese landscapes, or we know it through the arts and crafts tradition. Um, but for Neutra, it was both, it, it was both um, a thrilling dialectic, quote unquote, between uh, the smooth, natural human finish and that very um, earthy, earthy primal place once we, once we came, East Africa. So it was always supposed to represent kind of those that embody those two extremes. So of course you have it in iconic masterworks like the Tremaine on the left and the Kaufman on the right, uh, 1947 on the right, 48 on the left. And I also wanted to briefly, um, at least in my book, put paid to the idea that Neutra used silver paint um, in order to make wood look like metal and ascribe to any industrial aesthetic. His real game was perception. And silver paint, which he learned quite quickly from the Theosophists of Holland, um, helped dematerialize light in the most optimal way. So it provided the least visual obstruction between you and the landscape. And as um, he succinctly writes to Paul Smith on May 21st, 1959, the posts, transom, sills, stool, sliding door, and casement windows could be aluminum to create the least contrast with the outside brightness. Um, in some, and then he goes on and talks about you can also change it out to dark brown if you want. And in some, and in some Neutra houses, you certainly see the use of dark brown instead of a silver. I also wanted to talk a little bit about crimped metal fascia, and you'll see crimped metal fascia on the facades of many Neutra houses. So what that, what is this all about? There's the crimped metal fascia up there on the top right. And the, they're, they're, the crimping is at 3 16 of an inch. And what it does, it, it, because it, it's acting kind of like as a little tiny deep beam, it stiffens the fascia. So it makes it stronger. The second thing that the, crimp, the crimping does is um, it adds visual, it animates the, the roof line a bit, right? It's just a little bit of frisson in the air. And then the, the third thing that it does is because it's crimped, going like, like, like a sine wave, you can interlock the edges together and then it becomes seamless. It's, it's less visually obtrusive. So the crimp metal fascia is working very hard. Neutra also believed deeply in, um, in orth, 
orthogonality as an aspect of organic architecture because he believed very clearly, very strongly, that plumb and level are biological conditions, right? We're bipedal, we evolved out of apes, and we, we have, in our inner ear, we have little water levels, right? So plumb and level are as organic as anything um, in the Arroyo, for example. We decided that the crimp metal fascia, the straightness of it, was an imperative. There were dents and breaks and rusts and everything else with the original um, fascia. So we decided to replace that in order to, we needed to express those, that straight line that is so much a, a neuter tenant. So we contacted the company and out they, they dragged this 100 year old industrial machine out from the shadows and we got our crimp metal fascia. And the other thing I wanted to say about crimp metal fascia <laughs> is that, is that um, uh, someone was, Anthony was suggesting earlier that modernism is not, not craft, it's an idea. But I don't think you can express an idea if you don't have great craftsmanship. And rather than come down on somebody like a ton of bricks and say, you will do this, I think it's, from at least in this scenario with these individuals, it was much more interesting and harmonious, if you will, to invite one elite craftsman to meet another elite craftsman and to engage and transfer knowledge on crimp metal fascia from one to the other. And that's what you see happening with Gunnar and, and Eric in this image. In contrast to getting new crimp metal fascia, we decided that um, we would restore um, a historic vent. It's custom made, it looks kind of standard, but it was a, is a custom made vent. And when I got the price for a new vent, I thought, oh my God, I can't possibly tell the client that it's gonna cost that much. What can we do? Um, and so um, there's the original vent, and part of the problem in its rust, it was placed very low, low in the ground, right where there was a lot of run water runoff. So it was asking for deterioration and rust. So here's Gregorio, and again, I, I, to me, respecting craftsmanship and embracing people and bringing them in the conversation um, is, is really important, I think, in the process. Um, that was really, really hard to do well, and he did it brilliantly. And there you see the reinstated vent, and I did feel confident in placing a little bit a high, a little bit higher, because it didn't align with any other uh, any other datum line, right? There wasn't anything that it was relating to, so I felt a little bit more guilt-free about raising that up a bit. Then the other thing is about color. Right, um, the convention, con the conventional neutra we we know, is one which is relatively free of color. I mean, color meaning primary or bright colors. But um, Andrew Gray helped us um, scraping with the paint, and we found this fantastic um, salmon on the front door. And neutra had always intended that the, the facade would either be kind of a bright, brilliant salmon persimmon or a lemon yellow. And, and we brought it back to that lemon yellow and that, that salmon. There you can see on the left the articulation of, of volumes through the use of color. You know, color's pretty cheap, paint's pretty cheap, and it's a, it's a wonderful way to make a volume pop. Just a note on um, this, the original conditions. This house, as I mentioned, was so incredibly intact. And you do still have the, the yellow linen formica countertop. And um, anybody with a few shekels can throw a nice polished concrete countertop or stainless steel or zinc. But I defy you to get some yellow linen formica. <laughs> it's priceless. You'll note, too, that um, in the old kitchen, there's a burnt sienna, and here we, we decided, um, as, the, as our, our wonderful client calls it, Carrie Grant Gray, 
um, befitting a mid-century lifestyle, but it's in the same hue, it's in the same degree of saturation. I keep confusing those two, but... Let's go back to the, the famous um, collusion between two great lions, the former uh, Garden Grove Community Church. And what you see, um, just to remind you, that's the conventional Orthodox Neutra up there on the top left. But in fact, um, Neutra um, had inserted a large orange panel um, behind the white balcony where, where Schuler was striding back and forth between interior and exterior. And the, the, that panel disappeared sometime in the 70s. And um, so I was asked to come up with a color. And we had a paint an analyst come up with a, with a color, and they sent it to me. And maybe it was appropriate, but I was also thinking of a newly revived Catholic church, especially given Pope Francis on the scene, and the liturgical calendar, and am I my time up? Am I time up? Okay. Um, the liturgical calendar and other aspects of Catholicism. And so I, I strove for an, an orange that was slightly brighter. It's called untamed orange, which I thought was very appropriate for Pope Francis. Um, and again, engaging, engaging the, the crew in helping us work together as a team to relocate boulders. And one of the ways I did that was to bring down a lot of books and materials and show them the role of, of the boulders in other neutral landscapes. I'm just going to move along here. Boulders in the Pescher House, 1968, in Wuppertal, Germany. There's Gunter Pescher, um, 92. He just died on October 24th. Son of a stonemason, just like Otto Floss. Um, his use of color to animate very dark industrial winters. Um, and then Zeilendorf, 1923, and the colors inside. Um, and just briefly, we as preservationists and, and architects, this is the kind of pristine setting we like to um, genuflect to. Um, we forget that our churches' interiors may look like this rife with body oils and people crawling over balustrades and um, 912,000 people a year, 30 masses a week. So it's all about crews. It's all about the crews and the clients. That's the new steward of the Haley House on the left and Helen Kilberry on the right uh, with their 30-inch Railings and their yellow linen formica. Thank you.